Welcome to Danger Signals. <laughs> on the advantages of a nervous breakdown. Shortened from the fuller title, Danger Signals on the advantages of a nervous breakdown or a few neurotic symptoms. Shortened from the fullest title, Danger Signals on the advantages of a nervous breakdown or a few neurotic symptoms of certain men under 40 years of age. We decided to cut that last section in order to not unduly, even accidentally, even unintentionally add to the already disproportionate amount of attention given to men under 40 years of age. Certain men under 40 years of age. And so it became danger signals on the advantages of a nervous breakdown or a few neurotic symptoms. And then we decided to cut that middle section on account of it sounding sort of wishy-washy, perhaps, or unscientific. It sounded sort of like something that might be unkindly offered in a scribbled note by a lazy or overworked doctor in lieu of any real diagnosis, any real Diagnosis, leaving you to take the bus home once more, unsolved and without solution. And so, it became danger signals on the advantages of a nervous breakdown, which we shorten 
Island, as you'll notice from your programs, folded neatly in your laps with no rustling. Thank you. Thanking you in advance for no rustling. We decided to shorten it again once more when it came time to pay due attention to the arguably insignificant elements of marketing and demographic and an oversaturated, underinterested audience base. <laughs> because according to our focus group, which is comprised largely of uh, strangers and volunteers, as it wants to be said for it, full disclosure, our focus group felt that danger signals might be, could be, must be sexier. Which is, of course, the grand aim of all things. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing matching underwear under this outfit that was so much good for me. <laughs> That's why, when I turn around later to face the blackboard, to draw a absolutely scientifically accurate image of the human brain in chalk, on chalkboard with two hands, a two inch stick of box fresh chalk in each, when I turn around to complete this frankly astounding act, which must have taken hours of practice, hours of practice for weeks and months and years, when I turn around to successfully complete this act of scientific entertainment, your eyes will be drawn down, down towards my ass, towards my too tight skirt that was provided in the dressing room this morning. Everything is sexy. Everything is entertainment. Now, I'll stop talking soon because that's unnecessary, it's distracting. Unnecessary and not sexy. It's distracting from the story, which is a story about men, about certain men, and about the things they do. Welcome to Danger Signals. <laughs> Walter Freeman biography by Jack L. Hyde refers to the notable proponent or father of the American lobotomy as a medical maverick. Now, a maverick is an unorthodox or an independent-minded person. It's also a baby calf. When Walter Freeman was a baby calf, he grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and answered to the name of Walter Freeman II. Walter Freeman I was his father, and for all intents and purposes, if not a loser, then certainly not a hero, a GP, a family doctor, someone who dealt with common colds, not brains. Walter Freeman I doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. Now, Wikipedia would be invented for centuries after Walter Freeman's one birth, but it is important to live each day as though it one day might be recorded and scientifically distilled to a series of zeros and ones for bored college students or underprepared theater makers working to death. <laughs> Walter Freeman, one own father, his name was actually William Williams Keene. Williams Keene. William Williams Keene. William Williams was the first American brain surgeon and at various times and the, through the employ of six American presidents. Six. Who can even name six presidents? Please don't try. This is a high kind of space. <laughs> Walter Williams, William, Williams Keene, Williams Keene, no, categorically not a loser, has a Wikipedia page. Walter Freeman too, who we will now refer to as Walter Freeman, or Maverick, or Mav, grew up with a keen awareness of what it meant to be a loser and what a man must do to have a Wikipedia page, which is incidentally a website created and edited largely by men whose taken largely as fact content is updated and generated by 87% men, which According to the New York Times, is attributed to women's general unapparent willingness to, quote, open to very difficult and high conflict people, even misogynists. Walter Freeman studied medicine and doctoring and science. And sometime passed, as it is wont to do when you are learning a real skill. He began to dress like a showman and wear all sorts of funny hats. He carried a cane he didn't need. He started to think about his appearance. He thought about and with the brain. He thought about what it would be to be a man. And so he decided to move to DC and join the neurological department of the hospital. He saw what was being done and not being done. He thought about being male and a hero and having a Wikipedia page. He thought about being a man who solves more than the common cold. He wanted to do something. 
And while he was doing all this thinking, he also learned to draw a scientifically accurate image of the human brain in chalk on chalkboard with two hands and no looking. It was impressive! <laughs> it was also a little, you know, besides the point and unnecessary, but it was attention grabbing and attention holding. And that is probably something you should know about a man who wears all kinds of different hats and carries a cane he doesn't need and wanted to leave a real big mark on the world. Drugs. In Portugal, a neurologist with a severe side parting by the name of Igaz Monez is also thinking about the brain. Now, we're not going to spend too much time in Igaz Monez on account of him being Portuguese and a Portuguese drug user, probably, and this being an American show about American heroes and American fathers, but it is probably fair to say, to mention in passing, in fact, at least, that Mr. Monez, Senor Monez, was, if not the father, probably, then perhaps the grandfather of the modern lobotomy. The William Williams Keene to our own very much-loved Walter Freeman. The first man, Mr. Monez, to take a small instrument, similar perhaps to an apple core for the bakers in the audience, or a tiny spoon for the amateurs among us. He would take that small instrument, that tiny spoon, and use that instrument, that sharp, tiny spoon to cut and sever and scrape inside the brain and to cut away and out the bad bits. It's this beautiful instrument, the leucotome, similar perhaps to an eyelash curler for the ladies in the audience. <laughs> Mr. Monez did this <coughs> cute little apple cutting peel to 40 or so patients to start at first, to start with, you know, 40 brains, and he said, yeah, it went all right, okay, all right, nothing to complain about, really. <coughs> Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it? Nothing to complain about? <laughs> Although truthfully, <coughs> truthfully, in, in truth, if, if truth be told, Senor Monez was not the sole inventor, the grandfather, or not the only grandfather of the modern USA American lobotomy through the invention of the European leucotomy, which Freeman would later encounter, rebrand, remarket, and sell as his own American made to the target markets of his choice and opportunity. Because he too, Monez too, <laughs> was influenced by a, another source, a, yes, a, Thank God, American source, Sir John Fulton of Yale University. I have a note to hold for applause, which I will not disobey. 
Sir John Fulton, who <clears throat> was not in fact a sir at all, but it can be for the purposes of this presentation, and also to add greater weight to his acts, which simply amount to the scientific stabbing of a monkey, two monkeys, Becky and Lucy. Give it up for Becky and Lucy. <laughs> Becky, <laughs> Becky and Lucy, everybody. If you're expecting actual monkeys, there are no monkeys. There will be no monkeys. There are, this is an academic context where there are rules and boundaries and you are expected to use your own imaginations, use your own goddamn prefrontal reasoning to not need to, not expect to not be handed everything on a plate, every monkey on a plate. <laughs> there will be no monkeys today. And certainly not these monkeys, Becky and Lucy, who passed some short time following Archduke John Fulton's glorious experiments in cutting and trimming and inserting foreign objects into organic matter and wiggling, wriggling around, dumb and blind in the dark. Becky and Lucy, who had their skulls drilled clean by an absolute hero of a man in fresh clean scrubs and a smiling face with eyes that I don't like looking right up past the left corner of the photo, Becky and Lucy, who <coughs> should have been grateful, really, must have been grateful if gratitude and sincere and meaningful gratitude can even be felt by a stupid lolling female chimp, should be grateful to Lord Mayor Se Senior John Fulton for rescuing them, for saving them, bringing them out into the light of day, reprieving them from their previous behaviors, their unacceptable behaviors, their, which included, once again, to Wikipedia, rolling and shitting on the floor. What the fuck, Becky? <laughs> what in the actual fuck, Lucy? I mean, really, really, girls, ladies, really. Don't you know, don't you know that that is the worst, the most unruly, the most unacceptable behavior on the book? Rolling and shitting and running around like animals in a cage? That's why we can't refer to you as the grandfathers or godfathers or ancestors of savage modern medicine, even if it was your sweet brains that were sliced. We can't, I'm sorry ladies, don't look at me like that because my mind is made because you rolled and shit and probably got cranky at the time of the month and your brains were passive, not active. They were receptive receivers. They were the object to be pierced, but not the object. So then afterwards, after Signor Dauphin Fulton had the grace, the good grace, the goodwill, the godlike intellect and aptitude to cut you open with a pizza slice with extra olives. After that, after you had time to recuperate, time to calm down, time in the afternoon for your movies and your soaps, didn't you feel much, 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 much better? Jack D. Pressman, another fucking man who wrote a fucking book, referred to it as a cult of happiness for you, Becky. Lucy, I don't know about you because <clears throat> your narratives were not recorded. You became a secondary female character, character a best, best friend <laughs> to Becky. An ugly, plain best friend to Becky, the newly minted member of the... Of the <laughs> fuck! Don't <laughs> Any, Any of, of this, this is, is all about. about.